Why are some ponds clear and clean? Well, other ponds are stagnant, weedy, and full of bugs and mosquitoes. It all has to do with ventilation. Hi, my name is Dave Zovek. For 50 years I have been helping treat patients by ventilating them. And ventilation is an important part of what we're going to talk about regarding our ponds and maintaining their healthy condition. When a patient is sick, they might need to be ventilated in the hospital to help them uh, get better from their condition. And when our ponds are sick, a lot of times they'll need to be ventilated as well. With people, we ventilate them to improve the level of oxygen in their blood. With ponds, we ventilate them too, using bubble diffusers or other devices to increase the level of oxygenation in the water. That has a lot of benefits. It helps restore a healthy balance to the pond water. Using a bubble diffusion aerator, uh, it can help eliminate organic matter and sludge that accumulates in the bottom of our ponds. Also, the uh, uh, moving water is something that um, many of the uh, larvae, such as with mosquitoes, do not like. They want stagnant, non-moving water. It also helps reduce the, the undesirable nutrients that feed things like duckweed and other weeds. It also helps remove different chemicals that we may not want, such as ammonia, nitrates. So oxygenating our ponds really does benefit them. And as I said in previous uh, video, the oxygen level in water is only 1%. So it does not take a lot to reduce the level of oxygen to a level that cannot sustain your plants and your aquatic life, such as the fish. When we talk about an aeration system, we're talking about three main parts. One, the, the pump, the compressor, which compresses the air so that it can be pushed down into the lower depths of uh, your pond. We're also talking about the tubing, the tubing that takes this uh, air from the pump and delivers it to the lower depths of the pond and then at the end of the tubing is the last thing is the bubble diffusion uh, aerator which breaks the oxygen breaks the air up into small particles because that allows a greater surface area and also the particles as they rise will aid in the circulation of the pond itself. Look at, uh, consider when we are looking at aerating a pond, one is the depth of our pond, is it deep, is it shallow? The size of our pond, is it small, is it big? And also the shape of our pond. Those are the three categories of which we'll spend a little bit of time on, but we also have that we also can need to consider. And one is what is the purpose of the pond? Is it decorative? Is it one that we just like to have the, the, the water feature and the plants and all of those things? Is it for wildlife? Uh, to attract animals or to, to provide a, a habitat for different animals? Or is it one in which we want to either fish or swim or have a, any other activities in? Each of those factors are going to mean that we want to either uh, minimize or maximize aeration to, to the pond. So another factor to consider is flow. 
Is there additional water flow into the pond? Uh, this will bring fresh water, it will bring oxygenated water, and it will constantly keep the, uh, the pond in motion. Um, if it does have sufficient amount, then the aeration may be uh, of a minor need. However, if it's a pond that is landlocked and is filled by a spring or by rainwater, then we may need to take more active part in helping oxygenate the water. A pond that is for decorative use uh, for uh, looking nice on your property, uh, one, but one that you really don't want to do much more than that. Um, a fountain that sprays water up can be an enhancing feature or a waterfall. And you're not so much concerned about uh, uh, the depth in uh, plants that are deeper, fish that end up getting into your pond, but you're just wanting to make sure that it doesn't become a habitat for mosquitoes. Um, one that is for um, wildlife, uh, maybe you do want to have uh, a little less water motion uh, so that uh, there is plenty of uh, larvae or uh, bugs for the, uh, the birds and other um, creatures to, to eat and live on. Um, then you may not want to have very much aeration. A pond that you want to enjoy, you want to fish, you want to uh, swim in, you, know, you want to maintain a very healthy pond in which the depths of the pond are oxygenated as well as the surface. Uh, so those are the various reasons and things that we must take in consideration when we develop a aeration system for your pond. You'll find that there are various types of uh, compressors, pumps available. The simplest is called a diaphragm pump. Um, basically, it's uh, two diaphragms which are moved right and left. And as they move, they either pull air into a chamber or expel air out. And this is a nice, simple system. And it's often what you see for small aquariums, but it can also handle fairly large systems as well. They make uh, larger ones. It's also one in which the diaphragm from time to time may need to be replaced as it ages or dries out. The other is a, a piston style. And uh, those types, uh, whether it's a, a piston or a diaphragm, are very, very useful for uh, shallow ponds, ones that are five, six feet deep, because you really are not pushing against a lot of water pressure, um, and it's going to create a little bit of uh, circulation, but not substantial. So you'll probably need several different um, diffusing heads to uh, oxygenate that pond well. The other type are deeper ponds, ponds which uh, are well over five, six feet deep uh, that uh, may have uh, holes in them that are 15, 20 feet deep. And the overall uh, depth is fairly substantial. Uh, placing uh, a, a diaphragm pump on those really would not be able to push that air deep enough. It would just not make it down to the bubbler. So really what we're looking at is two others, such as a rotary vane or rocking piston. Those tend to be expensive. They tend to have greater output and they do a nice job. Now recently, uh, one manufacturer is claiming that their linear piston uh, pump is able to uh, handle depths of 30 plus feet 
uh, in that it has a significant output. And so we'll be looking at that as the possibility for uh, our pod. Next is the depth. Uh, we talked about that in a previous uh, uh, video that the length of the um, travel of bubbles from the uh, diffuser up to the surface has a big factor on how much air, is, how much oxygen is going to be able to move into the water. Um, so one that is a few feet uh, below the surface is going to have a very short period of time before it reaches the surface, but one that's in the, the deep hole of 30 feet will take much longer. Now, there's something else that occurs, and that's because of the movement of the bubbles as they rise. The bubbler that is way down into that 30 foot hole will release bubbles and as they rise, yes, they're losing oxygen to the water, but they're also pulling up with it uh, water from those depths. And that starts this circulation, the water from the depths uh, move upward, pulling that lower water with them, and then the surface water is pulled down as it comes up. So you start seeing this nice circular motion of the air rising and the water. So as you see in the, the images, it rises and then it drops back down. Now, couple points. Uh, some um, specialists, some uh, uh, experts in pond maintenance, they, they get concerned about a pond that has been established and you go in, you put in a uh, uh, aerator and you drop it down into the deep well and that pond may not have been uh, oxygenated for years and years. All of a sudden you start oxygenating it and you're bringing that low or unoxygenated water up with it. But there's not enough oxygen in the air that's in those bubbles. So you begin to deplete the oxygen, the water that is at the surface that is well oxygenated. And that can cause trouble for your uh, aquatic life. Some of the fish may not be able to survive if you, your whole, your amount of uh, water that is depleted of oxygen is significant. So they recommend that you, you run it periodically. Uh, let it stop. Let the uh, surface layer uh, regenerate with more air and oxygen in, in the water. And then each day extend that a little bit longer until you get finally to a 24-hour running pump. Something to consider. A new pond? Probably not an issue. Um, probably not a significant factor. It may be low on oxygen in those lower areas, but it won't have the the debris and the sludge that can really be churned up with an established pond. This whole circulation effect of the rising bubbles uh, has an important uh, interaction with how much aeration you need for a pond. For instance, you have a simple little quarter horsepower uh, compressor. You put it into a pond that is, let's say, five or six feet deep. Because of the distance that the bubbles travel, it's only going to be able to probably oxygenate a surface area of about a quarter acre. Now, let's take that same bubbler, that same compressor, quarter power horse, quarter horsepower, uh, drop it into a deep 20, 30 foot uh, hole of water 
and turn it on and that will now be able to oxygenate a surface area of an acre and a half. So you see the same compressor can do a bigger job if it's in a deeper well. So in the first example, you will need several diffusion bubblers to maintain a, a surface area. So you have surface areas to, to, to just simply oxygenate the air. And that brings me to the next, uh, next subject, which is the shape of the pond. Uh, a pond that is circular but deep is able to be oxygenated, aerated with maybe just one bubble head. Where is a, uh, well in the example you're seeing to my side here, is a 150 foot diameter pond just simply needs one bubble head. However, a long, narrow, but shallow pond, and maybe 150 feet long, but it's narrow, you may need two bubble heads to sufficiently oxygenate, aerate that water. Well, that is enough information for this session regarding pond aeration. Next time, I am going to show you how to um, build um, your pond compressor uh, cabinet. And uh, what I'm doing in mine might help you in developing yours. So, uh, as you see, we have a container, uh, compressor, tubing, etc. So, uh, come back again next time. And I'll cover how to build your own compressor cabinet. Thank you.